All right, good evening, everyone. Thanks for coming out. Our program this evening is the St. Patrick's Day flood of 1936. And uh, the flood of 36 was probably the, one of the worst natural disasters to strike western Pennsylvania, and definitely probably the worst in Oakmont and Verona. And so I can remember growing up, my grandparents spoke of the flood. I, I, I don't know if you want to admit to it, but a show of hands, does anybody remember? <laughs> One, two, okay, we have a few people that do remember. Uh, it, it must have been a traumatic event because they spoke of it for years afterwards. So I, I started to research and it was interesting because it, not only was it the story of a flood, a disaster, but what impressed me was it was a story of community and how the people in Oakmont and Verona came together and took care of everything that had to be taken care of. Uh, back then they didn't have FEMA, they didn't have state of emergencies, the politicians didn't come around and make statements. It was up to the people that, that lived here. And, and as we go through here and you hear some of the things they did, you'll be amazed that they just stepped forward and did what they had to do. On Saturday, March 14th, the Weather Bureau forecasted rain on Sunday with a high of 49. The river level was at 21.4 feet and falling. That was three and a half feet under flood level. Now in Pittsburgh, flood level is considered 25 feet. The normal pool level is about 16.5 feet, 16 and a half foot. And so when the water raises, there's actually a nine foot leeway in there before we have a flood. At 25 feet, that's what is determined to cause property damage and things like that, damage to infrastructure. And these numbers were all established by the U.S. Geological Survey and the National Weather Service. The following day, on Monday, the weather cast called for rain with temperatures of 30 to 35 degrees and the river level was still falling. It dropped down to 19.8 feet. On Tuesday, March 17th, Temperatures were still rising. However, western Pennsylvania received two inches of rain in 24 hours. Now, in addition to that, up in northwestern Pennsylvania, there was eight to 12 inches of snow on the ground. The warm temperatures caused a rapid melt, and that combined with the heavy rainfall led to the rivers start to rise. They came out with a new forecast and they said that the rivers were projected to crest at 32 feet by Wednesday morning. And at that point, the creeks and streams began flooding along the Allegheny and Monongahela rivers. By 9 p.m. on Tuesday, the water reached 34 feet, and the new forecast called for 37 feet by noon on Wednesday. Now, the all-time high was 38.7 feet and that was the flood of 1907. So here in Oakmont and Verona, the river began to rise on Tuesday afternoon. By Tuesday night, the area below the tracks in Verona was completely flooded. Now the flooding, just because of the lay of the land, the flooding in Verona was much worse than it was here in Oakmont. So when the waters began rising, they set up command centers, one at the Oakmont Borough Building and one at the Verona Building. And at that point, you started to see people start to move into action. A gentleman by the name of Ken Crusan, he, he owned the Oakmont and Verona Dairy. On Tuesday afternoon, he took his truck and drove out to the country to his milk suppliers, and he filled his truck with milk because he knew that if the flood came, they would need extra milk. So he went and got that for the residents of Oakmont. The firemen and police were called out to start rescuing people who were stranded in their homes. In Verona, 400 people were rescued from their homes. The Verona firemen used boats and actually rode down the streets and rescued people from their homes from the first and second floors. They were assisted by firemen from Penn Hills and Rosedale. Uh, there was a gentleman in Verona, his name was Eddie Ecker, and he operated a ferry between Verona and Blonox and he was helping to evacuate. And he had a rather large boat, 
and he was making one trip. He had 18 people in his boat and his motor quit. And the boat was swept out into the river with all these people in it. And the newspaper said that Mr. Eckert kept his cool and he tinkered with the engine and got it started. And he was able to bring everybody back into shore. The, as I said, the firemen went uh, door to door, actually f in their boats to rescue people. There was a fireman here in Oakmont. They were rescuing people at the foot of Pennsylvania Avenue. And he fell out of the boat and into the river. But luckily, the other firemen grabbed him, pulled him back into the boat. But what's amazing is after that happened, you know, you would think, you would say, that's it, I'm out of here. But he went home, he changed, came back down, and continued with the rescue. The evacuees in Verona were taken to the Verona High School. Now, they set up an evacuation center, but it was the principal and the teachers who operated it. So all the Verona teachers came down, they set up cots, uh, gave out blankets, and everyone that was rescued was taken there, and that's where they, they were able to sleep and, and take shelter. I also read that the firemen rescued seven dogs and a pet rabbit from Lower Verona, and they set up a temporary kennel next to the high school, and they took the pets there until the flood was over, and then the owners claimed them and, and brought, them, brought them home. There was a lady in Sylvan. Now, when I refer to Sylvan, Sylvan is the neighborhood below the tracks in Verona. Uh, there was a lady in Sylvan who was bedridden, and she wasn't able to get out of bed. So what they did, they rescued her bed and all. They brought the bed out of the house, they put it in the back of a dump truck, and they drove her to Pittsburgh Hospital in the bed. The newspaper said that the hospital officials were very appreciative that they brought her bed because they had a shortage of bed and cots at the <laughs> hospital. So, um, they set up a food center at the Verona Methodist Church. And that's where all the evacuees and the volunteers ate. And um, they cooked meals there and also out at Green Oaks Country Club. The Country Club uh, volunteered their kitchen, so they prepared food there and they took it down to the Methodist Church. The Cub Scouts, Girl Scouts, Boy Scouts in Upper Oakmont, Upper Verona, went door to door and collected food, which they took down to the church and helped, the, uh, to help feed the uh, people that were evacuated. The floodwaters reached 15 feet at the corner of South and East Railroad Avenues. So that shows you how deep the water was. Uh, the boulevard in Verona was underwater. And we have some pictures you'll see later of people canoeing down the main street of, of Verona. Plum Creek became a river. The whole valley field filled up with water. The water level, level came up to with 100 feet of College Avenue. So if you know how College Avenue sits up and then it drops down, that's how high the water came. Uh, Woodings Tool Works, Edgewater, and Scaife were all uh, submerged in water. They had to close down. What was interesting, all access in and out of Oakmont, there was only one way and that was by way of Halton Road. That was the only way you could get in and out of town because every other access was uh, flooded. There was no transportation between Oakmont and Verona because the Plum Creek Valley had flooded. That same afternoon, a rumor started to circulate that a dam had burst up at Johnstown and that the water was careening down towards Pittsburgh. The only problem was that dam burst in 1889, so there was, there was no uh, <laughs> a dam left up there to burst. But it just shows how when that, things like that happen, panic sets in. Uh, by noon Wednesday, the gas and the electric were shut off in both communities. And they did this to prevent any explosion or fire. So they shut down the gas, they shut down the electric. What was interesting, the Oakmont Water Authority kept supplying water all through the crisis. They had enough water in their reservoirs that they didn't have to shut off the water. And Oakmont and Verona were the only two communities in the Allegheny Valley who had fresh water during the flood. Uh, the Oakmont Telephone Exchange over on 5th Street, they had no power, so they connected the phone system to a gasoline generator and they were able to keep the phones working during the flood. 
Uh, there was a gas station in Verona, in Ver I'm sorry, in Oakmont, again, no electric to run the pumps, so the owner brought in a hand pump and he was able to dispense gasoline uh, to people who needed gas. The mail service continued in Oakmont while during the flood, and the advanced leader published an edition during the flood. They did it at candlelight, laid it out, took it up to New Kensington to a printer who printed it, and they had an edition out that week. So they were proud to say that uh, they didn't miss an edition because of the flood. Twelve Mile Island, over here right above the bridge, was completely submerged and all of the cottages except for one was washed away. The only one that wasn't was a stone structure, but it had been badly damaged. Now, I, if you're not familiar with Oakmont history, we refer to the Morris campgrounds, Heights campgrounds, Willows, Edgewater. Uh, in the early days of the 1900s, late 1800s, those were campgrounds and people came out and uh, spent the summers. By the time the Depression came along, that camping had gone away and people had purchased those houses and they were uh, permanent residents. So uh, when we refer to Willow's Campground, that Willow's Cottages, those were those cottages but they were now where people lived. And they took the hardest hit of all the, uh, the uh, buildings in, in Oakmont and Verona. The Willow's Pool, the water came up, completely filled the pool with mud and all you could see was the grandstands. It was just one big river. And again, another rumor started that the Halton Bridge was going to collapse. So people were afraid that they were going to lose the Halton Bridge. The rivers crested March 18th at 10 p.m. at an all-time high, 46 feet. That's 21 feet above flood level. And this is the headline from the Pittsburgh Post-Gazette. By noon Thursday, the water had started to recede and all the water above the train tracks in Verona had, had receded back and that land, that land was all clear. The Red Cross set up a temporary hospital with 10 beds in the VFW hall in Verona. The hospital was staffed around the clock by a team of nurses and they passed out typhoid vaccinations to the workers and the evacuees. Uh, the Red Cross established a command center in that building. Businesses began to open Friday, just two days later. And um, they didn't miss a beat. I, I found a couple of these ads. This is a flood sale. And um, this was at Spears Department Store. This was the corner of South and East Railroad. And that's where I told you the water was 15 feet. So the entire first floor of the store but rather than throw it away or sell, uh, get rid of it, they decided they would mark it down and sell it. So this was one of their ads. Here we have G.C. Murphy. They're announcing a, a rock bottom prices on all flood merchandise. And I didn't even know you could sell flood merchandise, but I guess back then you could. <laughs> uh, this was Mr. Gasbridge. He owned the, the Triangle grocery stores here in Oakmont. And I, I like the theme of his ad. It was all cleaning materials. He has Clorox and brooms and mops, uh, carpet cleaner, <laughs> everything you'd need to, to clean your house. As I said, uh, businesses started to open just two days later. The evacuation center at the school was moved down to the VFW hall on East Railroad Avenue, and the electric and gas was turned back on by Saturday afternoon. And as the water receded, you know, that wasn't the end of the work for the volunteers. The firemen went house to house, building to building, and pumped out the basements of all the flooded buildings. Again, they did it on a volunteer basis because that's what you had to do, and they went around and did that. Uh, the police chiefs in both communities deputized many of the men. And these guys came down to the police station with their guns. And they said one man brought his rifle, other brought their pistols, and he sent them out to guard the flooded areas to prevent from looting. And so they made sure that nothing was looted. The street crew in Oakmont and Verona, they were the ones that cleaned the mud off the street. They came out with dump trucks, uh, bulldozers, they cleaned up all the mud, the firemen helped uh, with the hoses and hosed down the streets. They set up a temporary dump 
in the area between Oakmont and Verona where the viaduct is now. And any of the old furniture, anything they cleaned out of the houses or any of the muck that they cleaned up, they took it all there in dump trucks and dumped it. Again, today you could never get away with doing something like that. But that's where they put it and most likely I would think they probably just burned it after the flood was, was gone. The American Legion over here on Isabella Street, they opened up their main hall to accept furniture, household goods, dishes, plates that people would want to donate to the flood victims that, that lost everything. So that sort of became a clearinghouse for anybody that needed any furniture or anything like that. This picture, I hope you can see it, it gives you an idea of the area that was flooded out. And this area in yellow here, you can see along the river bank, all up into the Plum Creek Valley, and then all of Verona underneath, below Allegheny River Boulevard, was flooded out by the, uh, the water. And now I'm going to show you a few pictures here of the flood. This, these two pictures were taken at Plum Street at the boulevard. Now what's interesting, the gentleman there is standing on the train tracks, and you know when you come into Oakmont there's that large wall? Well, he's standing on the top of that wall and you can see how high the water is. And there goes a canoe right by him. <laughs> this is another view. This would be standing up towards College Avenue looking down towards Verona and you can see the car submerged. Uh, that's on the boulevard there. You've probably seen this picture before. This is the Halton Bridge and that's an oil tank. They said that broke loose from somewhere up near Oil City. And, um, but what's interesting, if you look, you see all those people standing up on the bridge. That's the last place I would be. I mean, and you can tell, if you look towards the back, you can see the one bridge pier and you see how close the water is to the river, the road uh, deck of the road there. So it is, it is high. This is what uh, the area which was known as Morris Campgrounds. And this would be standing on Halton Road looking over in the area behind the speedway. And you can see the water is up to the rooftops in those houses there. Uh, if it got the sheets, we'd be in trouble. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's the area behind speedway there. This is another view. This is from Allegheny Avenue looking down towards the river there. And this is after, wa after the water had receded. And you can see the, just the devastation from the water there. The mud everywhere. Did Harmerville get a lot? Oh yeah, Harmerville got it just as bad. This picture was taken at the foot of Pennsylvania Avenue. And again, if you look back against the mountain, you can see the uh, row houses over there in Harmerville. But these were the houses all at the foot of Pennsylvania Avenue. This was known as Heights Cottages. Um, that was a bad, uh, severely hit too. This is another view from Pennsylvania Avenue looking upriver. And you can see the Halton Bridge in the background there. Here's the Willows Pool. You can see the grandstands and how the water came up, filled in the whole thing there. This is an interesting picture. Uh, does anybody know what that house in the center is? That's the Elks. This was taken from uh, over in Edgewater, California Avenue. Luckily that was built on a mound there, so you can see the water surrounding it. And then the two houses there on Washington Avenue, they set up from the street and you can see they, they were above the water, but the water surrounded that whole area there. This, this was interesting. Uh, this is 6th Street looking down uh, from College Avenue. And uh, that's the high water mark. That's how far up the valley the water came. So everything, you know, Woodings was pretty much all submerged and the whole way across the valley to Verona. Was, it, was, it was like a lake. There was so much water in there. Here's the main street in Verona. This would be looking up towards Oakmont on the boulevard. Here's another shot of Verona, the main street. You can see the water had started to recede at this point. Uh, they were starting to clean up a little bit. The trucks had come in. This is another Verona picture after the water had started to recede. 
Uh, who, who would ever believe that you could canoe down Allegheny River Boulevard, but there they are, right down the main street. This is Center Avenue. If we were looking, uh, the hula bar is on the end there. This would be in uh, the get-go looking over there. You can see how the water had come up Center Avenue. Uh, this was the days before we had the viaduct, and the only connection between Oakmont and Verona was the old trolley bridge. And this is a picture of the trolley bridge in Verona looking towards Oakmont. And again, you can see how the water has just filled the valley there. That's Plum Street. And that would be 4th Street up on the hill there, those houses. View Street and 4th Street, but that gives you an idea of how the valley had flooded. This is the area, Sylvan. This would be down uh, behind the Giant Eagle, from what I could tell. That's the, the best place I could pay, place that, that whole area down in there. This is the rail yards. This used to be the rail yards that were between Oakmont and Verona. You can see how that whole area flooded out. This picture was in the uh, Pittsburgh Press. It's taken in Verona. You can see them rescuing them out of the second floor window of the house. So the residents, you know, they salvaged what they could. They got out the bleach. They cleaned up their house and, and went back to normal. Um, somebody came into the History Center and told us they had family that lived there and their house was flooded and they cleaned it. But for years afterwards, they had the old wooden floors and they said the dust just kept coming up. You know, they could never get all that dust and dirt out. There was so much from the, from the river. By, by the Monday after, uh, school started again. So less than a week, school started up. Most of the businesses had reopened and went back to normal. They really didn't make a big deal of it. You know, the waters went down, they cleaned up and went on with their lives. On April 10th, uh, John England, he was the head of the Red Cross here in Oakmont and Verona, he issued a 40-page report on the flood in the Twin Boroughs. And what he said was there were 9,848 meals served at the Methodist Church. 300 people were quartered at the Verona School. 56 people were treated at the emergency hospital. 58 homes in Verona were swept away. 36 were swept away in Oakmont. And I, I don't know why he included this, but 300 pairs of socks were dis distributed to the residents of Oakmont and Verona. <laughs> that was them days, yeah. But most importantly, there were no deaths. Uh, no deaths and no serious injuries. They were all just minor Nobody cuts. Got in them no, they evacuated. They got everybody out of there before. And back then, they never worried about mold. Or no, like no, they no. They just bleached everything and went back to the and 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 I think that's what impressed me most about this whole thing was the people just did what they had to do, took care of it, and got on with their lives again. Today they FEMA. Yeah, yeah, they didn't wait for outside help. They, you know, they did it all themselves. And it was interesting, I found advanced leaders from the beginning of April, and you would think they would still be talking about it, but it wasn't even mentioned in the newspaper. You know, they, they, they had gotten over it. So the aftermath, what came of this whole flood? Well, afterwards, the federal government, through the Army Corps of Engineer, Engineers, built a system of 16 flood control dams on the Allegheny and Monongahela rivers. And these were used to control the flooding. And these, these flood control projects were set in so that we would never have another catastrophe like we had. And what they do is they, they're able to regulate the water by releasing it or holding it back. And if there's a lot of rain, they can shut them down back the water up into the, the forests where they are and then release it as needed. One of the largest is the Kinzua Dam up near Warren, PA. And this is a picture of it here. And, and what they do, there's basically a big lake behind it now. And that's how they control the uh, flood levels on the lower Allegheny. And uh, they said that they spent 500 million to put this project in place with all of these dams. But they said 
they've estimated that over the years that 500 million has saved 12 billion dollars in damages. So it has been able to control the the, the waters. Now in 1972, how many people remember Hurricane Agnes? Okay, more remember that. The, that sort of came in from the east, northeast, and came in above and they, they weren't able to control the water, but they still were able to control it to a point where it did, wasn't as bad as 1936. Uh, in 72, the river crested at 35.8 feet. Had they not had those dams, it probably would have been a lot worse. So, so they are very effective. I remember Hurricane Agnes, it came to the top of the, the, the wall down at the park and it was pretty much contained. And here in Oakmont, after the flood, they built the wall along the river. That's the, uh, they call it the riprap wall. It's 33 feet high and it extends from above the Holton Bridge to Washington Avenue. And it's high enough that when there are floods, it can contain it and keep most of it out of the community of Oakmont. It was, a, it, it was really a, a, a crisis, but like I said, the people handled it and got on with their lives. Thank you all for coming out.